This tutorial is a project of nonprofitaccountingbasics.org, a free resource developed by the Greater Washington Society of CPAs Educational Foundation. Our goal is to encourage accuracy and accountability to help smaller nonprofits successfully manage and sustain their organizations. Hello, my name is Sean Miller. I'm a partner with Caliber CPA Group here in the Washington, D.C. area. We're going to talk today about the OMB's new super circular and what to expect as part of the video series through the Greater Washington Society of CPAs Nonprofit Financial Accountability Task Force. So first of all, what is the super circular and why is it called a super circular? Basically what the super circular did was take eight or nine previously issued circulars from OMB and combine them into one large super circular. The circulars that most impact um, the people watching, watching this video would be A122, Cost Principles for Nonprofits, A110, Administrative Requirements for Nonprofits, and A133, Audit, Your Single Audit Act. When is the super circular effective? You know, as many of you may know, this took several years to enact. It started back in 2013. There was discussion, comment period. But now it is effective. So the audit period and the calendar year that we're in now, 2015, will be the first where you're required to comply with this new super circular. So any years beginning essentially 1 1 15 and later, you'll be required to comply with. What changed in the new super circular? Why is, was there a need to produce this um, from OMB? OMB's stated intent in this was to reduce the administrative burden and also address the risk of fraud, waste, and abuse. And there are a couple ways that they wanted to do this. One, eliminating duplication and conflicting guidance between the different circulars, um, focusing on performance over compliance for accountability. So we'll get into it in a little bit, but one of the things they want is to tie the performance back to the financial information. So not just that you're spending the money um, in accordance with the cost principles, but that you're spending it to achieve the objectives of the grant. So more tying the financial and program side together. Encouraging the efficient use of IT and shared services, consistent and transparent treatment of costs, limiting allowable costs, um, not really reducing them, but more clarifying what's an allowable cost. Setting standard business processes using data definitions. This is more of an internal matter at the granting agency. Encouraging non-federal entities that family friending policies. Strengthening oversight. Again, that's a big one that we'll get into that they talk about, particularly in regards to subrecipients and subrecipient monitoring. What you have to do when you give a subaward things that have to be in their award, and what it means to truly monitor that subrecipient. And lastly, targeting the audit requirements to the risk of fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, so while, you know, a few years back they changed the audit requirements slightly where we had to take a risk-based approach and analyze programs to determine which ones to audit, now as part of the granting process, the federal agencies have a similar process where they need to do a risk assessment on potential recipients to determine um, their riskiness. So some of the things that that they put in specifically to address these, the, the super circular itself has many subparts and sections. I'm not going to go through each of them now, that would take take hours. But some of the highlights that I think are important to go through, starting here with subpart C, talks about conflict of interest. Right? As we talked about, one of their stated objectives was to take a more risk-based approach and focus more on fraud, waste, and abuse. And obviously, as part of that, there's a conflict of interest issue. Um, so the awarding agencies have to have a conflict of interest policies. More importantly, and probably more relevant um, to you all, is that non-federal entities basically the recipient organizations, have to disclose potential conflicts of interest to the federal awarding agency. Now that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with having this potential conflict of interest. Now you could have a situation where one of your board members also has a, a company that you, you know, engage to provide certain services and they may be an expert in that particular service, so it's a perfectly legitimate expenditure of the federal award, 
But nonetheless, there is a potential conflict of interest there that needs to be disclosed. Um, so that's one of the ways that they're hoping to get more information out there, reduce that risk of fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, again, we talked about mandatory disclosures. Kind of gets back to it. If there is any type of violation of federal law, fraud, bribery, and so on, these all need to be disclosed to the, to the government. Fixed amount awards. Um, this is one thing that I think they're trying to do away with as much as they can, right? They really want awards to be based on um, performance and reimbursable basis. Um, so there are some situations where you can use a fixed award, but they are reducing that. Um, subpart D discusses what we talked about, performance measurement. So how are you going to relate the financial data to the program accomplishments and the performance accomplishments? And this is going to require a joint effort, likely, between people in the finance department, people who handle the, the financial information, and the people actually doing the work and the program side of things. Um, and this is going to be in conjunction with the granting agency, what information they're going to want, whether it be number of people served, um, you know, whatever else you, you're doing and how you're going to measure that to prove that what you're spending is the most effective way to spend it. Um, but this is a change from pure financial reporting. Now they want all this combined as opposed to having a separate program narrative and a financial report. It's all going to be together and you're going to have to correlate the two. So financial management, obviously a big piece of this is the financial management. How do you, how do you manage the finances in the organization as a whole but specifically related to the federal awards? So now they've stipulated some things that the federal financial management system must have. Um, identification of the accounts for all the federal rewards, disclosure of the results, something that identifies the source of these funds, and the last one there, most importantly, effective control and accountability over these funds. Um, we'll get into, into shortly, but that's one of the other areas of focus is on the internal control structure at the organization and surrounding the federal award program. All right, so internal controls, you know, when we've done single audits in the past, we've always um, tested internal controls, had to give a report on internal controls. So a lot of this may have already been in place. What they're hoping to do here is clarify it, tie it back to um, the COSO, the Committee on Sponsoring Organizations Internal Control Framework, to, to really emphasize the need for internal controls, that there needs to be solid controls, they need to be monitored, they need to be tested, and they need to be updated and maintained on a regular basis. So some of the areas where they've specifically focused are attempts to reduce this fraud, waste, and abuse. So for example, procurement is one of the areas where they've, they've really added some detail and added some language about what they're looking for here in terms of the recipient organizations. So obviously when we talk about fraud, and waste and abuse, one of the most common places for it is in the procurement area. Um, procurement being anything that you're buying with federal money or non-federal money. Um, so there's five types of procurement, which we'll get into momentarily. All of them must comply with these general standards. Right? It has to comply with your procedures. So the first thing, when you read that, so it has to comply with your documented procedures, means you have to have documented procedures. So that's the first thing, is have procedures in place that document how something gets procured. Number two, obviously the purchase is necessary. Um, number three, uses open competition to the extent required. Complies with your own conflict of interest policy. Again, so if you have a conflict of interest policy, make sure you're complying with it. And lastly, that the purchase is documented. All right, there has to be some type of support for the document. And again, these apply to direct charges, not, not indirect charges, which are separately treated. So there are different methods of procurement that they put into the, the new super circular. Three different levels, I guess, five different methods. One, micro purchases, so things under $3,000. Um, very small purchases, right, and that there's no need to get a competitive bid process. Small purchase procedures. Um, so there's a range there, currently it's around $150,000. And there you need to get some type of bid, some type of quotations, a formal you know, RFP process. 
For anything over $150,000, there's three methods you can use then to get these, to procure these services. Sealed bids, which is a very formal process. You formally advertise it in a newspaper and purely the lowest bid is what you choose. Those are somewhat rare, I think. Competitive proposals is probably the most common. I mean, this is your typical RFP process. You send out a request for services to a selected group of um, service providers, come back with whomever you see as most fit. May not be the lowest cost, um, but you need to justify it in some manner. And then lastly is non-competitive proposals, also called sole sourcing. And this is very limited, really only in a situation where there's basically one person or one entity that can provide the service you're looking for should be used very rarely. Subrecipient monitoring, another key area, really a big focus of the new super circular, um, particularly related to fraud and abuse areas where, again, you give money to a subrecipient, and then a lot of times people would say, all right, I gave it to the subrecipient, that's the end of my responsibility for that money. The circular now emphasizes and re-emphasizes that that is not the case. Right? You have to be responsible for how the subrecipient spends that money and then it's in accordance with, with the circular. Um, so they put in some language there about what's required in all sub-awards. Um, again, just to standardize things, make things a little clearer. So what they put in there that you need, some required data, again, the description, the CFDA number, the indirect rate, that's one of the areas that they've expanded upon, basically stating that you have to provide the subrecipient with an indirect rate. So if they have a negotiated indirect rate themselves, you have to use that. You have to negotiate a rate or you can agree to a 10% rate, kind of a de minimis, what they call de minimis indirect rate. But there has to be some rate in there to allow the subrecipient you know, to properly treat their indirect rates. Um, again, in the subawards, there's got to be a requirement that you have access to the subrecipient's financial statements and their records. So essentially what that is, it's an audit clause, right? It gives you the right to go into the subrecipient and audit them and make sure that they're spending the money the way you want it to be spent in accordance with the grant. And as we talked about before going into a new risk-based approach, in a, similar to what we've done from the audit standpoint, this is also what they're looking for granting either agencies or entities to do. Do somewhat of a risk assessment of the organization before you decide to give them the money. If you have prior experience with them, have they gotten audits in the past? And if they have, are there new people in place? Are they new programs? Um, did they get other federal awards direct from the government so there's a monitoring system in place from the federal government? All these things come into play and you need to consider those before awarding a subrecipient, a subaward, excuse me. And they've also gotten into what it means to monitor that subrecipient. Because as I mentioned before, just giving them the money does not end your responsibility. Your responsibility continues up until the time when this grant is closed out. So as part of that, the pass through entity, which is you know the entity that gives the subaward, you have to review financial and programmatic information, follow up with the subrecipient to make sure that any deficiencies are addressed whether they be deficiencies that you identify, or again, if they have their own single audit, that those are identified. Um, discuss with management any audit findings pertaining to the federal award and what they're gonna do about it and what their action plan is. So you really do need to take a much greater interest and monitoring role with these subrecipients. Some other items you may need to do that they specifically, again, specifically point out in the circular, provide training to the subrecipient, go on site and perform reviews, even to the point where you may need to provide for an agreed upon procedure or a program audit done by an outside CPA at that subrecipient to get comfortable that everything's being spent properly. Um, you can see by the, the amount of language that they put in here and the detail and the specificity of it that this is a big area of focus for OMB is subrecipient monitoring. So the last area I wanted to hit on is related to what's called the single audit. So the audits of agencies that get, or entities that get federal money. And what this is, so many years ago, they came out with the Single Audit Act, which allowed one auditor to come in and audit the federal award program of an entity altogether and provide one report 
to the federal clearinghouse, which would then be shared, if necessary, with the different granting agencies, basically avoiding the situation where each agency would say, I want you to audit it this way, I want you to audit it this way. So you would do a single audit. Um, over the years, they've increased the threshold slightly. Um, what they've done here is increase it, the audit threshold to $750,000 of federal expenditures. That's up from 500000 So again, if you get under $750,000, you are not subject to the single audit and don't need to have a single audit and don't need to submit the necessary documents to the federal clearinghouse. Um, they adjusted the major program determination, which is again, is something from an audit side, you have to audit a certain number of major programs and how you determine these major programs is a risk-based approach. They used to be based on a dollar threshold of $300,000, now it's up to $750,000. So again, focusing on the larger programs, the larger entities, the idea that that's where the risk is, is in these large dollar items. I mean, they increased the threshold reporting question cost to $25,000. That was previously $10,000. Again, wanting to really focus on larger items. So if there's a question cost over $25,000, that needs to, does need to be reported. This next one I think is important for people to know. So this requires the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, the FAC, to make the entire reporting package available to the public. So as part of that, that includes the financial statements that are attached to the, the data collection form that gets submitted to the Federal Clearinghouse. All that information will be public in addition to your 990 being public. Previously, only the data collection form was public, um, but now all the findings will be listed and so on. So what can you do going forward? Um, you can read the guidance, it's lengthy, but there are several places where it kind of summarizes the changes. There's some FAQs on, on the OMB website um, implement some policies, make sure you have procurement standards, make sure you have a subrecipient policy. Um, most places have procurement standards, make sure you follow them. The subrecipient management is, I think, an area where a lot of people don't have and are going to need to um, really focus on those. Determine if any change are going to affect your funding. Are there things you're going to have to incur that you didn't incur in the past? Maybe you'll need to get additional funding, particularly maybe related to indirect rates for subrecipients where you're not providing them those in the past, now you need to. How is that going to impact your budgets? And then lastly, just develop a plan to become compliant as soon as you can. If you haven't already and you get federal money, you need to do that as soon as possible because, again, this fiscal year and this calendar year is the year that, that these apply. So when you get your single audit for calendar 2015, you're going to have to comply with this super circular. So that's the super circular. The new super circular is very lengthy. Um, like I said, I encourage everyone to go to the, the OMB website and read up as much as they can. Um, once again, my name is Sean Miller. I'm a partner with Caliber CPA Group. And thank you for your time today.